evening to talk about uh, rural home businesses. it will be a conversation with probably another conversation to follow yet, but uh, we have all of our zoning and code staff here to talk through some of these issues. And I will turn it over to Sarah for introductions. Thank you, commissioners. Um, appreciate this opportunity to talk about home-based businesses. I wanna kind of set a little bit of a um, context of, I know we've got a number of topics that we want to get to the county commission here in the next couple months related to a variety of land use issues in the unincorporated area. So I just kind of, I don't want folks thinking like, this isn't what we asked for. We're going to get there. Um, and I wrote it down. Okay. So in this work session, we're going to focus on home-based businesses, specifically the way it's currently structured in terms of um, what is allowed and um, some of our current numbers, and then sort of trying to make the distinction of when this changes to when does a home-based business become a conditional use permit, which is something that comes up from time to time. Next, we want to have a work session on conditional use permits this year. I think we're going to shooting for a date in November. There's been a lot of work to um, get a comprehensive list of CUPs um, between our zoning and codes office and uh, the metropolitan planning office. I think we have that now. I think we're really excited that we have a great database that we can pull from to get good numbers, trying to figure out, you know, how many total equipment storage CUPs do we have, you know, versus another type. There are some that are out of date on that list. And my understanding is staff is going through them to sort of eliminate the ones that are no longer functioning. Excuse me. I know that is not necessarily all of the policy questions that commissioners want to begin to answer some of their some of their questions about how we use land in the unincorporated area and what uses are appropriate. But I do think that both of these work sessions will give you a lot more information in which to base that from. So as you're think as we're going through this, like let's talk about areas for future that you want to have future discussion on if there are future topics or how that would relate into some of these future things. And then eventually we can discuss if if there's some sort of like how do we want to have the if there's a policy level discussion about that appropriate use. Does that work for the commission? And I know of something I want to make sure Commissioner Kelly understood. Because uh, I know he's got a lot of questions in this area too. So, okay, with that, I think I'm turning it over to Ben Harris, who's going to walk us through this presentation. Tanya, we have a number of your staff here at the table. Do you mind introducing yourself or introducing your staff? So. 
Yeah, so I have all of the zoning team here today. So I think it might be helpful for everyone to introduce themselves. I'm Tanya Voigt, the Zoning and Codes Director. Carl Bauer, County Planner. And I'm Leo Runke. I'm the Administrative Zoning Specialist. Sorry about that delay. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm Ben Harris with the Douglas County Zoning Office. And today we're just gonna walk through uh, current home business regulations, current home businesses, and then um, some proposals and, and a, a plan from Utah State um, University that we really like as a, as a model and a comprehensive look at home business regulations across the country. Home business regulations were created to aid low impact ventures with administrative approval, encourage compatibility with residential areas and residents' economic goals. Um, they guide growing businesses to appropriate locations like type two home businesses that grow and need to seek a CUP. And they prevent excessive strain on public and private services for small scale commercial activities. And feel free to interrupt at any point and we can discuss and then move on. So this is just a look at our numbers. Uh, we have uh, 109 registered home businesses in the county currently. Uh, 13 of those have closed this year. And we've kind of had that trend the last four years. Uh, we, we closed quite a few during a cleanup phase uh, when I first started in 2019. And then we averaged 10 to 13 closures a year as people retire or, or move on or, or their business becomes a CUP or grows. Um, then we've also, uh, as looking through our numbers, we've seen that there, ha there hasn't been a lot of fluctuation since 2019, um, but there have been some that have moved on to CUPs. We also know of approximately 65 that are unregistered and uh, one of the goals of updating the regulations may be to permit a greater variety of home businesses by right in specific zoning districts. Examples of per permitted by right businesses could include professional offices, home crafts, classes, personal care services, small scale agriculture, and service repair. I'm, I think you actually clarified what I was going to ask already, and that was oh, when we say we've closed those businesses, it's not something that we did, we did to not. them. It was just kind of acknowledgement that they they have yeah. finished their operations and are asking to close out that project. Yes, every year when we when we send out the renewals, we also send a letter just kind of talking about how things are changing and you know, but showing some appreciation for their their service to the county and also asking for their renewal if they're not renewing them to let us know that they're closing and then we close them from there. Did they ever give you any feedback in that process about how the interaction with the county went or what that what the impacts were that made them decide not to continue with that business? That's That's been part of the goal of the letter that we send out, but we don't get feedback. Okay. Unfortunately. Um, since the home business regulations were adopted in 2000, a lot has changed especially regarding technology and how that complements, enables, and enhances home-based businesses. This is a picture from the Friends TV series, and they did not have cell phones during that time. And that was at the time that we adopted our current home business regulations. 
Uh, one challenge with current home business regulations is the requirement that a home business must transition to uh, type two classification when it operates in an accessory building. Uh, this transition can sometimes trigger the need for a conditional use permit. For example, uh, if a craft making business such as candles or chapstick production wanted to operate in an accessory building, it's categorized as a type two. Additionally, a maximum area of five acres is needed for all type two home businesses. In property zone CP and AG2, a CUP is needed for type two home based business regardless of the potential or proposed use. This is kind of hard to read, but we felt like it was a good snapshot to, to get a visual of you know, how, how the businesses are broke out, broken out. Um, this is the current registered home business list, and it, it shows around 50% um, are all in the trades. So we've got we've got things like um, construction, excavation, electricians, tile work, carpentry, plumbing. Um, that's approximately fifty percent of what's registered. And then if we move on to the next slide, um, can I have yeah, you sure back up um, of the types that are listed in that chart? Um, like what percentage of that would be these ones that could potentially be just approved by right? Be is it a, we, a large portion? We estimate that that's also around 50%. Okay. Thanks. And then on our second snapshot, we have the registered and the known unregistered. And that's, it's still very similar. It's around 50% trades, but um, we do increase quite a lot in our, in the construction category. And I'll show you so, those numbers a little further down. Um, this shows the current registered home businesses, and this is just a glimpse so that you can see the numbers instead of the percentages. If we added the unregistered, then the construction category would go up to 40, just as one example. And then the next two slides, uh, it's going to be a four-year snapshot, um, just showing how things have changed um, since 2020. And uh, um, this was interesting because it's actually, even though we have closures year to year, it hasn't fluctuated a whole lot as far as which um, which categories are shown. Um, this one we, we felt was kind of enlightening just to see which townships are, are hosting the most home businesses. Um, we talked about Where's Grant Township? There's actually one um, that is going to be renewing. Um, it's a transfer in the family, and it, that's why it's not showing up yet. <laughs> yeah. This list um, shows us the four years and how the different category, these are the top seven categories and how they fluctuate. Utah State University zoning for opportunity document underscores national home-based business trends. Um, home-based businesses provide economic opportunity. They benefit marginalized groups and have even acted as incubators for major companies like Disney, Apple, and Amazon. They also offer lower operating costs and enable a balance between work and family life. The Zoning for Opportunity document assesses three generations of regulatory frameworks for home-based businesses. The first generation initially called home occupations. These regulations restricted home-based business to activities typically done at home, not considered a business, but part of residential use. The second generation framework uh, combined traditional standards with new performance standards, introducing permits. It closely aligns with Douglas County's current home-based business standards. The third generation, driven by technological changes, this framework focuses on how home-based how home-based businesses impact neighbors. It's supported by digitalization and the growing recognition of the importance of home-based work. Uh, 
a new home-based business model based on the third framework in the zoning for opportunity document allows low impact home-based businesses to operate without a permit, also known as permissionless innovation. Growing or potentially impactful home-based businesses can obtain special permits or conditional use permits for flexibility and neighbor protections. Despite a recent surge in remote work during the COVID pandemic, local home-based business trends have remained stable, indicating that many inconspicuous low impact businesses may be operating under the radar. It's important to note that the Zoning and Co's office rarely receives complaints about permitted home-based businesses. The commission's input is critical in shaping updated home-based business regulations. Businesses with significant neighbor impact like extensive contractor storage, increased traffic and retail sales often involve county commission approval. Understanding the commission's preferences regarding permissible activities, especially those considered by right, such as small single employee candle making or woodworking businesses and accessory buildings is valuable. The main objective is to establish updated standards that balance public health, safety, and welfare concerns related to home-based businesses while enabling innovation and economic growth. As staff prepares to bring forward a set of updated home business regulations, we hope to address the following topics. In addition to Board of County Commission feedback and additional requests, an evaluation of the current fee system, permitted by right standards for certain categories and impacts that do not have a measurable neighbor impact. Register those with low impacts to verify standards are met. When standards cannot be met, a CUP would be required. The possibility of home-based businesses permitted in accessory buildings without a CUP requirement. And then more to come, we're working on uh, with planning to research all existing CUPs and Zoning and codes will provide an upcoming work session. We also just wanted to plant the thought that as new business uses continue to seek and gain approval, a road impact fee may be worth considering. And that would bring other departments to the table, of course. Just kind of as a framework, um, what are the main impacts that are can, should be considered as we're looking at like what can be by right, what needs to be permitted, what needs to have a greater process like through a CUP and conditions and such. Um, I mean, I can think of noise and certainly that road, road impact, which you mentioned kind of with the fee. What are some of the ones that rise to the, the top? The primary ones that I can think of and Tanya can help if I miss any are would be um, noise related, ones that have a lot of noise trespass from the property. Um, Home, business, home businesses that have a lot of traffic come in and going that exceed the, the type two allows up to four non-resident employees to come and go. Um, even that sometimes can kind of become a bit much if they're coming and going very frequently. Um, and then it just depends on the type of business and how much big equipment that they have coming and going. And then the last one I can think of would, would be screening their materials, how they're storing things. Since 2000, when our regulations came out, um, in, in my mind, and I want you to tell me if this is a, a correct assumption, but it seems like a lot more non-farm residences have outbuildings. It's kind of a standard part of the rural uh, living. Um, and, and so there's always been this division between what could happen in the home, and then there was this big shift to what could happen like in an outbuilding. And it seems like maybe that's less of an issue now, because if, if the outbuildings are already there and permitted and part of that kind of visible neighborhood, does it matter necessarily what, what happens in there if it's somebody's business or somebody's personal things? That seems like an odd thing for the county to involve themselves with. So I'm I'm glad to see kind of that that shift of like, well, what truly what can happen here that shouldn't matter to anybody, shouldn't need to be regulated. Um, and, and then it's just a question of if we have things that are permitted by right, is are we are we interested in collecting data on that just for economic purposes or is it just that that will, you know, under the radar is, is also totally fine for some of these uses. So 
one of the challenges we just had a meeting about open space with the county appraiser if we do go to permitting by right where they're not registering with us then we don't have the data necessarily behind it and then the appraiser's office would not necessarily pick up on if someone's using 120 square feet of a room or the garage is used just for business purposes then we wouldn't be generating necessarily that commercial tax component yeah, I think that's one thing that people don't understand is that, or don't always appreciate is that this list is shared with the appraiser's office for property appraisal values. And then they work with the landowner to sort of determine what should be taxed as commercial and what should be taxed as residential. So I would, I think that leads us to trying to have some sort of notification of by right. But I mean, I think we know we've got a lot of folks that don't, you know, that that go under the radar and we don't see. And you mentioned that's a fairly large number of just ones that you know about that are operating and they're not um, um, permitted in the county. So how does that information come to you? And is and does that come from the appraiser? Is the appraiser aware of those or where, where do those exist in that gray area? Um, I, I would say about half of it comes from a, a list that I inherited when I started that had about 300 businesses on it that we sifted through to see who was still active. Um, and then we also get a couple a year that we're notified about. Um, also when we're doing property research, we might notice Google or some other service helpfully tags a property and they're just added to the list. Um, we've, we've tried at times to to bring a category forward. Um, we did that with excavation and it kind of bogged down the planning commission and um, staff. It, it takes a lot of resources to process them when we all, when we bring them forward all at the same time. So before we bring a bunch more forward, we, we really wanted to wait till we had a better set of regulations. So those landowners that are on the unregistered list have not been contacted because we really want to make sure we have a set of regulations that work for everyone before we inundate the system. So what causes businesses to come forward and want to register? So there's so many that don't. Um, many of them probably don't know that that's something that they are expected to do. Um, of those that do come forward, like what, what benefit do they have? I mean, they're I would say um, probably three areas. Some are already operating a business in the city limits and want to move it to the unincorporated area. Um, that would be a fairly large portion of folks that are contacting us because they're already related to getting permits, maybe just in a different jurisdiction. Another set would be neighbors bringing to light to us that something's happening. There's a heavy truck traffic going back and forth or dump truck full of dirt going back and forth, those type of things. Um, and then I think there was one more I was thinking about, but I forgot it. It could also be um, state agencies that ask them to make sure you check with your local government as well. So then they'll email us and say, hey, is there anything I need to do? Yeah, I think you'd be surprised at the number of places. Like we get a lot of, I mean, I get calls saying, I want to register my business. What do I need to do? And, you know, it, it, I, I think in other parts of the country, it's very common for every business to be registered, regardless of where you're at. So, uh, you know, we get those kinds of calls sometimes. Yeah, when people are also doing just home searching yeah, um, and say they're looking for, they want the garage space because they know they want to run a business out of that then they usually, when they're reaching out about, you know, questions about the property, they're also asking about, can I do this business from this property? And I can add to that, like in a system that is complaint-based as much of our uh, regulation is um, having having a certification or a conditional use permit that says to the back to the neighbors, like I am allowed because I went through the process to do X, Y, Z. Um, I think maybe perhaps helps some of them feel um, accepted in that neighborhood and and have some some backup. So that's I guess what I think of it. Um, 
when we were looking at the list of like impacts and we talked about noise, we talked about road impacts, which would be either employees or equipment. Um, the other pieces, um, customers, clients, like that can be um, huge. And so like some things that you'd think would be a larger impact, um, but have no customers might actually be less of an issue to the community than somebody that's, you know, teaching lessons or having somebody that's um, you know, frequently coming back and forth on, on the same roads and roadways. So is that, is this number of customers or clients mentioned in our current regulations? I know the number of employees are. It is uh, type one home business. You can't have more than six students, I believe at a time. I don't think it restricts how many classes you could have. And then if you wanted to have more than that, you would either jump to the tier two or you'd have to look at other categories that you might fall into, like a school or something else. And then you mentioned kind of retail sales. The home-based businesses don't permit, they, we don't permit retail sales. So how we've gotten around that, especially post-COVID, is we've done really some really small scale stuff by appointment only. So if they're a business that has quilting fabric and some, they can set up an appointment with someone to pick up the quilting fabric that they purchased online that has, um, but just full retail sales open eight to five, it's not allowed right now with the home-based businesses. That's a good clarification. And if it, if that were part of the business model, then we're talking, I mean, agritourism, CUP. Um, Oh God, the words, they were right there. <laughs> then the other thought came in front of them. Um, yeah, well, I'm thinking, and I wish I had a magnifying glass, honestly, for this little pie chart situation, <laughs> but um, like, I think I saw, um, you know, like personal care services in there. So I'm going to assume, you know, like massage um, as an example. So are there any limitations, like the number of customers? So you mentioned students, Ben, but number of customers in that sense um, or auto repair for that matter, um, where there is a, a coming and going of a customer factor. We have treated those really on a case-by-case -case basis, to be honest. The regulations conflict even when it comes to automotive repair. One section of the home-based business regulations say automotive repair is prohibited. Another section says it's permitted. And so the the regs are so old and so sort of out of date that it any of the online sales or even appointments, maybe besides beauticians, that's something that's been pretty regular for a lot of years by appointment only. Um, we tend to not restrict the number of by appointment only as long as we're not receiving complaints. I do think that's something that as we're looking to revise these, that this is a this is a point staff has mentioned that we need to have some sort of factor for measuring public traffic of whatever venue or type and that that could, you know, at least needs to be documented and you know, if it, I mean, I don't think many of them are high intensity, but that could maybe only be allowed in certain, like in type two, which also has a, a lot size restriction too, which I don't know that we talked a whole lot about. And maybe that's something to mention that, you know, when we do have any sort of complaints, they tend to come from rural subdivisions. Um, and, you know, because they're all closer together. So... <laughs> And yeah, they they have the ability to watch each other a lot more regularly because they are closer together. And some of them have covenants that say that you can't operate a business from that subdivision. So then they'll reach out to us if they think someone's operating a business. It's kind of like you read my mind, Tanya. I was curious if covenants and deed restrictions have been, I mean, I assume they come up occasionally as, you know, many things in your work does, but um, if there's been any particular trends associated with that, that sort of um, push up against or conflict with the way the regulations are currently. It happens quite often that um, a developer who's creating a set of covenants for a subdivision conflict with the zoning regulations. 
So the zoning regulations are the only regulations we enforce. If it's a covenant issue, then that becomes a civil situation between the homeowners association yep. or the developer and that landowner. Thank you for that PSA. We do have one um, restriction that ties in to subdivisions that if they've retained that road as a private road, their home businesses are not allowed to operate off of a private road. Um, so that can sometimes, especially we, we've had a few that were very small scale. And even then, like, those, those are hard. So I was just going to say, even if there's no, because some of these businesses, I mean, are truly like, if my partner were a software engineer and uh, running their own business, there's all of their customers are virtual, right? There is no public impact, no noise. So, I mean, is there? So I think if we went to buy right, I think that would be really helpful. So if we said like those professional offices where you're really just working from home, if if those were by right, then then they would be allowed to be on private roads. That is, we need that to get supersede. Yeah, we really need to get a lot of what I would call the very low impact ones yeah. of these off of their backs, yeah. but also find a way to capture some information to go to the appraiser, but make it extremely less burdensome and hard to follow. So I was going to ask, um, especially with the lot size. So like if you, so if you have to have five acres in order to do a class two home business, is that correct? Is that something that like, that's the correct lot size to restrict based on kind of the number of complaints you get, or what would you recommend that makes the biggest difference? I would say lot size is irrelevant that we shouldn't regulate based on lot size at all and based only on impact would be, I think, the best direction to move forward. I'd only say unless the accessory, unless there's something with accessory buildings and lot size, you know that, but that. Even those, I mean, we have someone who um, was in a subdivision that wanted to make chapstick in a garage, so. And I couldn't. Right. Legally. Which is no, crazy. It, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. And and that's kind of where I was going when I first wrote added this note down until we were talking about that there are more complaints the tighter that the residences are to each other. But I guess we're just reframing um in terms of talking about the impacts. So we're talking about things that are real as opposed to like lot size, which may or may not be relevant, or private roads, which may or may not be relevant. So I'm very excited for those conversations that happen and 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 getting more things by right that kind of reflect. The world we live in in 2023 and not the world that was in 20, 2000 when when those were written just um, so many people able to work from home and nobody it wouldn't matter to anybody and i think it's particularly difficult because those are the folks that have voluntarily come to us and said hey we want to do the right thing and then you throw up all this paper in their face as opposed to the folks that never even bother so it's i think that's something just as we try to be a really customer oriented, citizen oriented government that's frustrating for staff. And something that I would like to see, and I'd love your guys' feedback on would be when we talk about traffic, usually the neighbors are calling, you know, because of dust um, or if it's heavy truck traffic, kind of the safety component of having the heavy trucks on the roads. But I think we need to have a much broader conversation about the road type, the road condition, if there's a low water crossing, if there's a blind curve, if it's paved, if it's not, um, if there needs to be a bridge widened, if it's just a little tiny one lane bridge, if it is traffic generating, we need to be looking at the bigger picture of infrastructure. Um, we haven't done a good job with that, even with CUPs. And I think that's something we could really work to improve and it would make just a lot better permit processing if we were factoring those types of things in because then you're on the proactive side versus the, oh, now we need to build a new bridge or we need to replace the slow water crossing or this blind curve is a big safety issue because we have now all this traffic on it because um, we sometimes deal with the after effects of things. So we see that back end and, and it's hard to do anything about it then at that stage. 
So how do we write that into regulations that that feels equitable to people? Say my neighbor can can perform this business that they want to, and I can't because I live around this curve. Um, and maybe that's helpful when people are looking for a home to say the infrastructure can't handle that here, but it could other locations. But that just seems really tricky. And I, I get it. I think that that is cost forward for us to be thinking about that before they go in as opposed to trying to be on the hook for you know new infrastructure because of something we've permitted but i think that'll be a little tricky to work yeah, out it's tough i have been um, trying to keep an eye out for commissioner kelly and i see he is unmuted would you like to weigh in yeah i just have one or two questions and then since we're looking for a little guidance here maybe some thoughts um I was sort of taken how construction and carpentry are different and construction and electrician and plumbing are different. How do you separate those two? I, I think that typically it's been how they identify themselves. That's the main reason. Could it be a difference in, so when I, I mean, there's lots of different types of carpenters, but um, who maybe are woodworkers, woodworkers identify as carpenters and, and furniture builders, um, builders and makers. Um, and I wonder if folks who are identifying as construction are contractors. And people who to, might do more than uh, one trade. Right, yeah. and who might have some subcontractors even coming and going from a shop on there. But I do think, I mean, to that to Commissioner Kelly's question, I maybe, I mean, self-identifying is good, but maybe trying to really hone in on some um, pretty specific categories would be helpful for you all in really organizing those standards. And I, it did strike me that there are, it well, it actually just struck me that there were that many trades that made up it. But then I thought, you know, about all the independent contractors that are, um, yeah, so anyway. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And we can definitely give you a lot more information on how that breaks out. And I guess I would I'd sort of wonder if, you know, especially if they're self-identifying why it's important. Like I'm more interested in the impacts. I, I'm very interested in if we're storing six vehicles there for a business, people are driving to the business, picking up the vehicles and then going somewhere else. It, it doesn't matter to me if you're a landscaper or a, you know, you could be a lot of things in that situation. So the type of business doesn't matter. But I think what I am interested to understand and interested in regulations are how does that impact the community? You know, how many vehicles, and that may be a different type of business, not so much on outbuildings or, size of lot but more on number of vehicles number of employees or i'm interested in having a further discussion of like how many customers come to your site and customers could be private lessons to sales and you know limited sales and that was a similar list that i had commissioner kelly of uh like as we're talking about trying to reframe things in terms of the impacts like do I care if they're a plumber or a contractor or whatever, or do I care if it happens within the building or if there's outdoor storage? Uh, so at outdoor storage, vehicle parking, employees, customers, and just trips. And I think one of the ones that has come up uh, again and again, it might be a separate conversation, has been um, like the landscape businesses where none of the work occurs on that site, but all of that, all of those trips kind of come and originate from the multiple trips per job back and forth on the same roads with heavy equipment. So just looking at those impacts, um, that seems to me the direction we're going in terms of how we regulate things. And I think that that is better discussion. Yeah, the current regulations, they do make you identify um, how we've found ways to get around that is we call them and we figure these things out based on the information that they've provided us. We have folks who say they're an electrician we want to know if they have employees coming back and forth. We want to know if they're doing any storage of vehicles, any storage of equipment, that type of stuff. And then we speak with them to try to determine if they're 
you know, at the home-based business level or if they tip to a CUP, many of these businesses have employees, but they've agreed to meet at a different location and deploy from somewhere in town so that that traffic and that generation isn't happening there just to stay registered and have the ability to be a home-based business. It may matter too if their uh, employees have their own vehicles, so they are at the end of the job not coming back to that headquarters, but going to their own location as opposed to um, a vehicle that's registered with that business and that has to come home because that just creates another trip or two trips. I don't think we do have that conversation with them when when we're talking about how many vehicles can come and go. Only thing I thought I'd mention, and I remember this from when I was interim director occasionally you have some folks that like on the landscaping side had brush piles and then either wanted to do burning or mulching and or what i would then call some clean rubble dumping perhaps is that so i think that could be a consideration that's more than just outside storage sometimes those could be things that need to be at least informed of the rest of our zoning regulations and and um, monitored in some way. You know, we, we've had a lot of issues with clean rubble dumping in floodways, so. And some of those that are higher impact, like that next level of impact, if we consider those, that may be when we need to talk about a, a lot size or setbacks. Set mics, setbacks might be the better way to do it just because that right to the edge of your neighbor's property line may just not be appropriate, um, even if we would allow it with a, a a larger setback. So that's a conversation. And we've talked about like the, the zoning director should have some flexibility to kick it to a CUP if they feel like they need to based off of the complexity. Also something that I think we've also mentioned that maybe there could be a variance process. You know, let's not if, what do we not know about home-based businesses? So if somebody wanted to request a home-based business variance, it could go to BZA and they could review that, you know, if it was something that really did fit in small scale, but we said for some strange reason, you know, it didn't. And so without having to make them go through a CUP. I 100% think that one of the goals of this discussion is to allow for a variance process because what we decide at this table matters to the future of how people um, explore their own economic success. And we can't imagine all of the variability that's being asked. So some flexibility for staff, I think is important. And then beyond that, a, a, a definite process so we can have those conversations instead of just saying no. And sorry, Commissioner Kelly, you have unmuted. Um, no, I think we're on the right track in my mind in the conversation. I just want to share my support for some low impact things by right. But also, and I always worry about brainstorming in these sessions, but, you know, is there a way to say that businesses need to register? But if the registration comes via complaint, it's a different fee. I don't know if that's a good idea. I'm just trying to think of a way. I've been thinking, Commissioner Willie, about like, why would be the good reason to, to register? What would be the plus if it was by right? But if it was... You know, if you just registered and it was a low fee just so we could keep track of those businesses. But then if we you weren't registered and we got complaints, you know, that may be a different fee. That may be a terrible idea. I recognize that. But I'm just I, I want to be I, I'm really supportive of some like the software engineer as work has really changed to be home based. I want people not to have to worry too much about that. And there's a difference, I think, too, between working from home and owning a business at home. Yeah, those are all excellent points. And I'm glad to have you bring them up. And I that that has kind of baffled me about like what what incentive have we given people <laughs> to uh, to come and register their business when it raises questions that they didn't think to ask and we didn't think to ask until it's kind of already on the public sphere. And I, I think it feels punitive. Um, so I, I, I'm happy for whatever brainstorming needs to happen after this to kind of figure out how we um, f find a way where, where it feels you know, healthy and wanted for businesses to register. Um, and and maybe, maybe that's something to explore in terms of like, if they come as a complaint based, that it's a different process. Like we want you to come forward on your own. If it comes forward in a different way, we might have a different process to so just incentivize. And I'd rather be the incentive than the I mean, rather the carrot than the stick, but we may have to come up with a little bit of both. 
And if you're thinking if it's coming in as a complaint, it would be if the complaint is a true violation. So if something is really apparent that it may not meet the standards, because we do have a lot of really friendly zoning reporters of items out in the county. And sometimes it can verge on just the border of people being picked on. And so I would really want to make sure that the complaints that were coming in were legitimate um, concerns. At this point, I'm not sure that people have any idea that they should be registering their businesses. So, I mean, yeah, there, there has to be some some um, component of grace there too. Um, Commissioner Kelly, you were still unmuted. Are you still? I'm good. Thank a thought you. to share? Okay. I wanted to kind of say something else about the, the dust, uh, which is a, something we have, every CUP has a conversation about dust and um, the same is an issue with home-based businesses. Uh, and, and the dust palliative is the only option that we have that we kind of talked about. It's very expensive for the applicant or the business owner. It's also not great in the environment. I mean, it is a um, salt-based component that if you overdo it can hurt grasses and you know, go into waterways. Like we've, we've kind of treated it as like, this is the only tool we have. So we use this tool. Are there other things we should be looking at? And, and one of them is probably, I'm a little guilty of this too, but speed limits, um, lowering speed limits on gravel roads that are having more traffic. And maybe that's how we kind of save the lifespan of some of those roads as we're pushing the boundaries of, of what they can handle. And that would decrease dust quite a bit. And it seems like the townships have varying levels of, you know, how much they want dust palliative to even be put down. That's why we tend to want to lean a little bit more towards like a road impact fee, because then the township can decide how that money spent, where it's going, if it's going for water versus dust palliative, like a chemical. Um, it gives them a lot more leverage of where that money is spent and how. Water, are you saying as um, as a dust suppressant? Correct. Do townships have the ability to apply that, or is that also through the county? Because the county applies all of uh, public works applies all of the dust palliative. Is that right? Public work contracts the dust palliative out, um, and then the water trucks on county projects often they'll run their own water trucks on projects for dust. I think townships are. Probably like we have a lay down yard right now. They've contracted with a special contractor to apply water on the roads. Okay, thanks. Because I didn't think they had typically the trucks to do that, but I think you're right. Like that's something that can be contracted. Um, is the road impact fee something that you can explore more and come back to us? Um, I like that. I'd like to be able to move away from the the palliative that we have. If there are other options that could be explored. Yeah, I agree, Commissioner, really. And I wonder, I mean, is the the idea of a road impact fee something that you are thinking about broadly with CUPs and TBUs as well? So and rather than that singular condition that we apply and then have on the spot discussions about calculating mileage and road frontage and fairness of the, you know, but and and I guess my follow-up question to that is. I think I just heard you say, Tanya, that the road impact fee would be a direct to township, assuming it's a township road. Um, and those are conversations that you've had, at least with some of the townships, about sort of preferred mitigation. Yeah, I, um, we've talked to a couple townships just about their thoughts and ideas on it, and every township is a little different. Um, so I think it will take a little bit more effort to really explore that option and make sure that all the townships agree to that, are in supportive of that, and then what that looks like for them. Two thoughts there. Um, we do the dust palliative that we have been doing because that we know that that will solve the problem directly for the neighbors that are sitting in front of us that are going to be impacted by that project. If that fee goes to the township instead for their discretion, that may happen or may not happen, um, which means then that conversation may happen at township hall meetings, which is okay too, because that those are that is also a local taxing jurisdiction, then those roads are under their jurisdiction and, and not ours. Um, so that might be entirely appropriate, but I just, that's a difference in like power in terms of like who's solving the problem for the people who are coming forward, um, but it could lead to some better options too. 
You know, we do have our upcoming township annual meeting. This might be something worth discussing with them. Yeah. Tanya's like, oh, great. But no, uh, it, I, it's something we could also get feedback from townships on. And the other side of it that I think works in favor very much of a road impact fee going to the township is, so if we have a, a, a business that comes forward and we ask them to do dust palliative from the nearest paved road, they've now um, taken on the responsibility for an entire possibly very busy neighborhood and everybody else's impacts, and they've carried it alone. And I've certainly thought of that in, in some that we've had that that was not fair, um, but they could pay the portion that corresponds with their use. And then that could be a discussion with the township. Now, exactly how that, how the impacts, you know, get dealt with from the township, that I don't know, but that would be kind of their discussion, but there might bring some fairness back. Uh, we, we feel that it would also capture some support from those CUPs and home businesses that are off of asphalt or paved roads that typically they're just kind of thought of as lucky. They don't have to worry about dust or adding dust palliative. Um, but if everybody across the board is pitching into an impact fee, they're also helping to support the repair of those paved roads. So would one recommendation be that this type of business with this kind of uh, overall impact pays the same fee regardless if they're on a gravel road or a, um, or a paved road? Because we have given favor to really high impact uses that occur on paved roads because it doesn't have the impact to the neighbors that the others do. So event centers would be probably the one that I think of because it's so much traffic and the other would be the landscape companies. I think that would be part of the, the, the discussion with public works and the townships and there'd probably be a formula that would be applied based on traffic and vehicle size and things like that. Um, it. I struggle just a little bit with the paved road, you know, um, conversation because the paved roads are very expensive to maintain as well. They typically have a lot more users, even not even necessarily rural users on them um, because they're major thoroughfares. But it is complicated because those can be a million dollars a mile to maintain versus a gravel road that might just need a little more gravel. Um, so I think the formulas would maybe need to be different, but... Uh, we definitely have not researched or looked into it or have a good answer on, on that topic. Another complication of trying to figure out that road fee, who it applies to, is that the gravel roads typically are township roads, the paved roads typically are county roads. Who gets the fee based on where they're living? And is it a question of those business owners are lucky because they're on a paved road, or is that good choices and just a, a reasonable use. Cause we do have um, commercial nodes identified out in the rural area that are kind of prioritized for commercial developments. And that's because they have good road access and that's kind of just good planning. So I don't, yeah. I think this is really good feedback. Um, I, one thing I guess I wanted to check in with staff, I we've, Planning and zoning and code staff have a lot on their plate this fall. Um, and But I wanted to give the commission an idea of when we thought we would be back to them with some draft regulations. And please don't, I mean, I think we know that this has been a while in the works, but I, I just, I don't know that with everything you guys have got on your plate, what you think you, when you think you'll have something to come back. I'm just thinking out loud. I'm open to any conversation or guidance from the commission, but I would really like to have the research done on the conditional use permits, have the work session done on CUPs. So we have this kind of overarching big picture idea of what we have, where we are, and then bring home-based business and then follow that up with draft CUP language as well. So I'd like- First quarter, 2024. Yeah. And when we come forward with that CUP information, we can also provide that additional research on who are these contractors, like what's their impact? Is it a person with one vehicle that comes and goes? How many cars are coming and going? We can you know, summarize all that across the, the whole. Well, I've been very excited to have this conversation for many, many years. So I'm excited that, uh, you know, 
what kind of conversations we've had with it and what you're going to bring back to us. I'm just really appreciative of any kind of common sense, you know, changes that we can bring to home business regulation with, you know, just a very different business world than what we've had when they were written out. Um, do my fellow commissioners have any other comments, questions, or thoughts to wrap up? Anything else you have for us or need from us? Thank you. Thank you. I think we are uh, recessed until our 530 business meeting. Thank you very much for being here.